Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. So we can clearly see that we have to die to live. The more we die to self, the more we die to selfishness, the more we live, I mean really live, in the spirit. Which part of you are you going to keep happy? There's two kinds of lives that we can live. We can live the self life or we can live the God life. If we live a self-directed, self-motivated, self-centered, self-willed life, we are just going to be miserable. And many of you that are unhappy now, not only here in this room, but people watching by TV, you're unhappy. You may even be saying to God, I don't know why I've lost my joy, but most of the time the joy that we've lost is not because of the problems we have it's because we're full of ourselves even sometimes we're just trying to solve our problems ourselves and it makes us miserable what we need to do is learn how to live the god life we need to learn how to come into harmony and unity and oneness with god we need to learn to want what god wants to think what he thinks, to feel the compassion that he feels for hurting people, to feel the mercy that God feels for people that are lost, and not just do the fleshly thing of judging them and criticizing them and condemning them. We need to learn to say what God says, act the way he wants us to act, and hopefully and prayerfully, we can someday say, truly, I and my Father are one, as Jesus said that. Now, legally, we are one with God. He's in us. We're in Him. When Jesus came to live in us, He brought a seed of everything that God is. The Bible calls Jesus the seed, and He is the seed of God. I love 1 John 3, 9. I use it very often when I have an opportunity to do altar calls, or I even use it when I talk to people about salvation on TV, but I'd like to just take the time to share this with you for a moment, because I think that it will help you to see what I'm talking about. There's a wonderful thing that happens inside your spirit when you receive Christ as your Savior. You may feel something, you may not feel anything, but we tell people all your sins are washed away, but it's even much more than that. You become a new creature. God puts His Spirit in you. And he gives you a new heart. Ezekiel 11 says that he takes the, the stony, hard heart out of us and puts in us a heart of flesh that's sensitive and responsive to the touch of God. God literally gives us new desires and a new want to. The problem is, though, is that we still have a flesh. And the flesh is your body and the part of your soul that you've not turned over to God. And so the flesh still has and always will have fleshly desires. So now we have a war going on. God's pulling for one thing. We've got these new desires in us. We can understand what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, what is my problem? The thing I want to do, I don't do. The thing I don't want to do, I'm always doing. And we get it. It's like, yeah, I plan to be good. I get up and I just act ridiculous all day. I don't understand, God, what is my problem? So it's very important for you to take the time to learn with me tonight a little more about your makeup. You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. You're a tripart being. Just like in the Old Testament tabernacle, there was an outer court, an inner court, and the most holy place. Well, the most holy place is our spirit. When you receive Christ, when you ask Him to forgive your sins, the Godhead comes to live in you. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, come to live in you. That's what the Bible says. That's what I believe. Everybody say, God lives in me. Now, why he would want to pick this thing for a home, I don't know. But it's pretty obvious that he has to come and live in us and lead us and guide us and direct us from this new home that he has because we simply would never make it one moment without him. When he comes, he cleans everything up in our spirit. Listen to this. 1 John 3, 9. No one 
born of God, no one born of God, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practices sin. So I would just pretty much have to say, if I'm going to believe the Bible, that if you say that you're born again, but you deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practice sin, then you're not born again. Because the Bible, now I didn't say that if you sin, you're not born again. I said if you do it, you know you're doing it, you keep on doing it, you're doing it deliberately, then there's something wrong. Because people who have a heart after God just can't do that. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you are going to be uncomfortable sinning, and you are going to spend the rest of your life trying to be what God wants you to be. Amen? Now, whether we arrive at the place we want to be or not, I don't think is nearly as important as the fact that we keep pressing on in God. And those of you that are still with me on the TV program, you haven't given up yet, I'm proud of you too. Because only the Word of God is going to change us. So, he says, no one born of God habitually, knowingly, willfully practices sin because God's nature abides in him. His principle of life, the divine sperm, I love that, remains permanently within him and he cannot practice sinning because he is born of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away and all things become brand new. Yeah, well, Sister Joyce, if I've got all this great stuff going on inside me, then what is my problem? Well, I can tell you that very often people can be a Christian all their life and they're never taught what it means to die to self. Nobody ever teaches them that. My goodness, I was a Christian for many, many years and I didn't have any idea that I was anything other than what I looked at in the mirror. I didn't know that I had a spirit, I had a soul, that I had a body. I didn't know that if I would feed my spirit, the Word of God, that it would become strong enough to no longer let my flesh rule me. I didn't know that I didn't have to stay angry just because I felt angry or that I didn't have to say something just because I wanted to say something. I didn't know that I could do what was right even though I felt like doing what was wrong. I didn't know these things. I didn't understand that I was a tripart being and that God had come to dwell in me, but now we had a journey together. And there were things that God was going to put his finger on in my life, and he was going to ask me to surrender. Yes, God, you're right. I surrender that thing to you. Go to work in that area, God, and change me. I can't change myself, but I ask you to change me. I didn't know that surrender meant pain before pleasure. So even when I would try to surrender, the moment the pain started, I was running away, not wanting anything to do with it. Well, I finally learned that you only inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. You got to stick with things, let God do what He wants to do in your life. If He's put His finger on something in your life, you need to work with Him, study the Word in that area, pray in that area until God works the work in you that needs to be done. He'll let you rest a little while, probably not too long, then He'll put His finger on something else. And that will go on as long as you are on the earth and you need to learn to love it. I said you need to learn to love it. I said you need to learn to love it. God chastises those whom He loves. Those whom He dearly and tenderly loves, Revelation says, He chastises. So every time God shows you something that needs a change in your life, that's not an opportunity to get condemned. Oh yeah, another thing wrong with me. Me, you know, I'm just, nobody's as bad as me. How could anybody have, I used to think, how could any one person have this many problems? Why are you always dealing with me? Why don't you deal with Dave? Why don't you deal with somebody else? Why is it always me? And you know what? God's not all, in or all that interested in your opinion about what he needs to do in somebody else. What he wants you to say is, here I am, God, change me. Do what you want to with me. I just want to be what you want me to be. I want to be one with you. Dying to live. What does it mean to die? It means to cease to exist. And the thing that's good is while you're dying to something, there will be pain. But when you are dead to it, there will be no more pain. I'll give you an example. One of my problems for many years was I just was not happy if I didn't get my way. And 
When I wasn't happy, I always had to say something. <laughs> always. My body language and my words let you know that I was not happy. <sighs> How many of you are pretty good at that yourself? So, yesterday I said to Dave, there's a restaurant in St. Louis that I just love to eat at, and he's not real crazy about it. He'll take me there once in a while, but it's probably my favorite place, and he don't care for it. Don't know why he don't like it. I think it's a test from God, but he doesn't like it. So I said yesterday, you know what, when we get home tomorrow, I'd really like to go to this certain restaurant to eat. He said, nope, don't want to go there. Now, there would have been a day when I would have said something like this. Well, that's really nice. I work all weekend. And I go home, and I'm dead tired, and you're going to go watch a football game or a baseball game, and I'm going to be drained because I've given everything that I have all weekend to all those people, and now you won't even take me to one little place where I want to eat. And then we would have had an argument, on and on and on. And I can honestly tell you, when he said, yes, you nope, I don't want to go there, I thought, okay. That's freedom. Can I tell you that that is freedom? I remember one time when Dave and I were looking for some pictures for our house, some paintings, and we stopped in a store that was in the mall, and there was a picture there that Dave really liked, and Dave and I don't always like the same thing when it comes to decorating, and so I didn't like the picture, he liked the picture, I didn't like the picture. Come on, I want you to get the picture. I didn't like the picture, he liked the picture. He wanted to get the picture, and so I start in. I don't like that picture, I don't want that picture in the house. We are not going to get that picture. I hate that picture. What's wrong with the picture? I don't like the picture. Well, you know, Dave, is a, he's, a, he's a loving man, and he don't like to fight and argue. And I mean, it's not that he doesn't stand up to me. He certainly does when he, when he needs to. Now I'm not that much trouble, but I used to be a handful. <laughs> and so he just said, oh, forget it. Just do what you want to. Well, we started walking down the, the mall, and my flesh felt kind of... You know, it was almost like I could feel it kind of inflate a little. I don't even know what I'm talking about. And I heard the Holy Ghost say, you know, you think you won, but you really lost. And I didn't know back then what I'm trying to tell you now. This is some of the ways that God taught me that for me to have to act that way to get my way was not a win. Or I could have said, you know what, I really don't like the picture, honey, and I'd really rather that, you know, we not get it. Can we just look for something that we both like? But no, I had to have an attitude. I had to shoot my mouth off. I had to have the body language to go with it, make the faces. <laughs> and then I thought I won the argument because I wore him down. And God said, you didn't win. You lost. Can I tell you something? That any time you get your way by acting ungodly, you have not won, you have lost. And not only that, one more time, you have fed that problem in your flesh and kept it alive. Let me tell you how you kill the flesh. You stop feeding it. I could bring any plant up here, and we could not feed it for a period of time, and it would die. Weeds will die if you don't water them or feed them. And that's how we die to self. We just simply stop giving in to the ungodly desires in us that God has put his finger on. And here's the thing you have to understand. You can't change yourself. I could come to you and say, you talk too much, and you could try real hard not to talk so much, and it wouldn't do any good at all. But if God puts his finger on you and begins to tell you that you're talking too much, now if you'll cooperate with God, you're going to have the power to change because what God orders, he also equips you to be able to do. Are you with me? And it's so important that we understand this whole thing about dying to self. Because if we don't, we're just going to go around and around and around and around the same mountains. I mean, I was in church for years and years and years. I mean, maybe 15 years. I never heard anything like this. I just went to church and went home and stayed the same. Argued with Dave all week. Had temper tantrums. Had fits. Got mad at everybody. Gossiped about the preacher. Went back to church. <laughs> Come on, you're laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Didn't really want to go, couldn't wait till it got over. I mean, do we really think that that pleases God? All we're doing is putting in time, thinking we're going to get some kind of a check mark on our calendar in heaven, and God's just going, oh, give me a break. <laughs> 
2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12. Father, help us tonight as we learn and grow together what it means to say no to self and yes to you. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 4.10 Always carrying about in the body the liability and the exposure to the same putting to death that the Lord Jesus suffered. Now we know that he died physically and that he was put to death physically. But let me tell you something. He had to die to a whole lot of other things too. One of the first things that we see in Philippians about Jesus is that he made himself of no reputation. Well, we need to die to caring too much about what other people think of us. Now, how many of you know what I mean when I say die to that? I mean that that's not an important thing to you anymore. You don't have to have that to be happy. You know it's not the will of God. And if we care too much what people think of us, we're, we're going to become people pleasers and not God pleasers. And any time that we become people pleasers, then we're going to end up missing the will of God. So when God begins to say, okay, you're worrying too much about what people think, and he begins to put his finger on that in your life, then you need to know that that's something that God is asking you to no longer have a relationship with. He no longer wants you to be alive in that area. You see, if you're dead in an area and Satan comes and touches you in that area, then he doesn't get a reaction out of you. I'm dead to this thing now about where we eat because I got tired of getting mad. And so if Dave won't go where I want to go, then I'm just like, okay, well, we'll go where you want to go. Sometimes I'll try to talk him into it, but then it works sometimes and sometimes it don't, you know. Just depends on what kind of woman power I've got that day, I guess. <laughs> but you know what? I'm never tempted to rob a bank. Probably not many of you will be tempted to go out and rob the local gas station when you leave. You're dead to that kind of stuff. There's nothing in you that's alive to that. But you might be tempted if you leave and you get in a line of traffic and somebody cuts you off. <laughs> you might still be very much alive in that area. And even though you just walked out of this meeting, you just might act like nobody could tell you were here. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. So then that's an area that you're going to have to start praying in and saying, God, I really want you to change me in this area. So how would you change in that area? Okay, the next time that somebody cut you off in traffic, if that was a weakness for you, then you would feel it all coming up in your flesh. Help me, God, help me, 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 help me. I've gotten to the point where I'm waiting for a parking place and somebody pulls in front of me and gets it. I am not giving them my peace, not one ounce of my joy. I'll just say, bless you. Bless you. I'm dead to that. Now, there's a lot of things I'm not dead to yet, but praise God, I'm not where I need to be, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be either. I'm growing, I'm changing, I'm on my way. Now, when you don't get your way, you're going to feel it in your flesh. And the only way that you can die to that thing is by not giving in to it and not feeding it. And then every time that thing happens, it'll get easier and easier and easier to where that will no longer have a hold on you. How many of you have experienced this thing that I'm talking about in some area of your life and you now have victory in that area? Okay. How many of you still have several things to go? All right. So guess why God has you here tonight? Just to remind you, the more we live the God life, the happier we are. So verse 10, 2 Corinthians 4. Always caring about in the body the liability and the exposure of the same putting to death that the Lord Jesus suffered. So that the resurrection life of Christ might be shown forth by and in our bodies. So we can clearly see that we have to die to live. The more we die to self, the more we die to selfishness, the more we live, I mean really live, in the spirit. 
Which part of you are you going to keep happy? Are you going to keep your flesh happy? Keep giving it what it wants so it can puff up and feel smug while you're full of death inside? Are you going to do what you know God wants you to do from your heart? Let your flesh have its little fit, get over it, and then have a joy and a peace in you that nobody can ever take away from you. Come on, give God praise. Now, Paul said, my determined purpose is to know him and the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I'm in the body. There was a man in Matthew 8, 22 that Jesus said, follow me. And he said, well, Lord, let me first stick around here until my elderly father dies and I'll bury him. And Jesus said an odd thing to him. It sounded almost hard-hearted. He said, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Now, I don't think that that was at all intended to say, don't care about your parents, don't care about your relatives. I think that there's a much greater message there. You need to stop paying too much attention to dead things, things that aren't producing any life for you, and you need to learn how to do what I'm telling you to do and follow me. We let these things that have no life in them at all keep us from following Jesus who is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Dead things include selfishness, jealousy, greed, discontentment, strife, fear, anger, worry, unforgiveness, bitterness, self-pity, <laughs> lust, addictions, excessive debt, laziness, <laughs> on and on and on and on. You might, for example, be going to a dead church. You may go there every week. You don't want to go. You wish you didn't have to go. Can't wait till the thing's over. You're watching your watch. You snooze a little, take a little nap. You don't have one idea what anybody said when you left. But you put your time in. Guess what? There's no reward for anything like that. None. Well, why do you go there? I don't know. It's just what I've always done. If I leave, Grandma will get mad. I don't know. If you're going to a dead place where you're not growing, you're not being challenged, you're not changing, then there's no life in it for you. You're wasting your time when you mess with dead things. How many dead things are you giving your time to? How many things do you have on your schedule that don't produce any life for you at all? How many dead-headed people are you hanging around with? Well, I got a reaction. Now, let me back up here and say there are a lot of wonderful churches. Wonderful churches. But I tell you, when you, when you go where there's some life, how many of you know there's life in this room tonight? I mean, my goodness. I mean, I had no idea people could carry on like this in church. I mean, you guys are singing, you're shouting, you're laughing, you're clapping, you're excited. You want me to just keep going and keep going? I don't see people going. That's because there's life in here. And we need to learn when we're touching life and when we're touching death. And when we're touching death, when you sit at the lunch table and you complain about your job and you gossip about everybody at the office, it is death. You're eating death and you're going to feel full of death. You're going to be sad. You're going to be grieved. You may feel depressed. Then you're going to wonder, well, God, what happened to my joy? Bury the dead things and go on with God. Get rid of all your dead attitudes. God has an inheritance for each and every one of us. And the way we receive it is through faith and patience. Remember, whatever He asks us to do, He has already given us the ability to do that. We can accomplish the goals that God sets in front of us because He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us.
Je kindertijd. Een tijd om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan. En om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren. Groeien. Geloven. En dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen... die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meermalen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen. Onze kinderen. Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long. die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden? 